challenges. As you just heard, my book from Yale came out in September. From the start, I thought of the book and the digital project on railroads and the making of modern America as complementary and interdependent. The website was to be a publicly available platform for assembling research, integrating data, collaborating with other scholars, and experimenting with forms of argument and interpretation. <coughs> now, about a week before the book came out, I received a phone call from someone named Harvey Rockman. Mr. Rockman is a film producer, and he saw the book listed in Yale's website. And he saw the link to the digital project. And he said he wanted to make a film of the Iron Way. Now, I was stunned by this development. I assured him that such an enterprise could not be undertaken for business purposes. I mean, really. <laughs> Perhaps this was some sort of elaborate tax shelter. <laughs> or maybe a front for something awful, like the illegal trade in exotic species. Or maybe it was a part of a charity program to benefit poor historians. I don't know, but when I got the phone call at my office in Old Father 638, uh, here uh, in uh, 612, sorry, I've changed offices, um, he was calling from Florida, from Key West, and I think that was meant to impress me. Um, I'm not sure. He said, oh yes, he was serious. I could find him in IMDB. He produced a studio film in 2008, Misconceptions, about a religiously conservative Southern woman who agrees to be a surrogate mother for two gay men in Boston. One is African American. Much confusion and comedy ensue, apparently. I'm not sure. I haven't seen it. He was working with someone whose name I did not immediately recognize. I guess that means that this person had not been on Dancing with the Stars recently. No one famous like the guys from Duran Duran or Ali Sheedy or, I don't know, Kirstie Alley or someone like that. I just didn't, I didn't know who they were. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he said in total seriousness that all I needed was three acts, one to set up the conflict, one to have the conflict, and last, a resolution. Three acts, simple. So, you know, there's the Civil War, there's conflict. You know, the resolution part was a little hard to figure out there in this third act. Hmm, railroads. There's conflict, and there's conflict, and there's more conflict. So I was not sure what he was suggesting. But in any case, what I needed, apparently, was something called a treatment. Send me a treatment, he said. Now in this encounter, it was clear that everything could be reduced to a treatment. It was also clear as I stumbled to explain the digital project and the book and the relationship between them that we were worlds apart. I had been to Key West, but not his Key West. I could not translate the way that the book and the digital project worked together or produce a treatment for him uh, in any reasonable time. And I was dubious about the whole uh, enterprise to begin with. But it does indicate our audiences, and I, I, I want to step back just to say, it indicates just how people love the humanities, they love history, they love literature, they want to know more about it. The subjects that we have are of great interest to people, and enthusiasm. I'm going to step back and say the digital project, from my standpoint, was a sub-sub-library, to borrow a phrase from Herman Melville and Moby Dick. And it was the work of the sub-sub librarian that I saw myself as undertaking, one of classification, of interconnection. It required getting out in the world. It required talking with other collectors and librarians, subject matter experts in this. In a way, it is a different scholarly identity, the sub-sub librarian. This is a role that in the digital humanities we've embraced as a public one not a private one. And it reverses what has been the practice for generations of guarding your sources and your research plans. The acid test of this is who, when they walk into special collections, checks the box, yes, I am willing to be contacted about my work. <laughs> this public role of collecting, of sharing, of opening the sub-sub library is one that I've cherished. 
in this project. Even so, as Melville warned, the archive, however authentic, offers, he said, only a glancing bird's eye view of what has been promiscuously said, thought, fancied, and sung of Leviathan by many nations and generations, including our own. Well, there was a further problem with the idea of a film script or a treatment. Much of what I was doing in this project, spatial approaches to history, even networks approaches to history, was about understanding process rather than explaining causation. It was about exploring the making of modern America. The web project itself, the archive, and the book that came out of it, I wanted to hold up a correlation that I was seeing in the archive between what had been separately told stories. Civil War history had been told largely in one framework, Railroad expansion had largely been told in another framework, and the two stories had never really been brought together. The goal of the book was to explore this correlation. It was about process, not causation. And actually, that came up today in Stephen Ramsey's undergraduate and graduate seminar today. We're having a great discussion about this, how spatial history changes the way we think about such matters as causation and what we're, what we're looking for and writing about. Very hard to translate into a film script of three acts. So this, this view of history is interactive, not static. The digital project offers an immersive experience rather than a linear one. A way of bringing readers into the history, allowing them to participate in the reading of history, in the exploring of the correlation I was seeing. Now, when we produce a work of scholarship, in whatever form, Jerome again reminds us that to make anything is also to make a speculative foray, foray into a concealed but wished for unknown. Now, I assure you that what I wished for in setting out on my digital project was not necessarily to produce a movie with Mr. Rockman or any other equally famous director, though I have not ruled out such a venture, and I should say that this is a guiding principle of digital humanities, and that is keep your options open for as long as possible. <laughs> so, the digital work that we create, McGann tells us, is, quote, not the achievement of one's desire, it's the shadow of that desire. And I guess I'm particularly aware right now of that disjunction. Um, because this project has been in development for five years, and uh, with the center here, we have explored and created a large digital archive. We've created large databases of, of historical materials. We've experimented with visualization models. We've produced scholarly research publications. We have a cohort of graduate students who've uh, been trained in digital history and brought into this project. And it, and we have new, new students in history and other humanities disciplines who are interested and involved. And we have an audience of students out in the world, the public, readers. But McGann's comment keeps you know, ringing in my ears. It it's, keeps raising its head. What we think we build, will build and what we build are not the same thing in the digital humanities. This is true, of course, of a book, a film, a painting, symphony, but right now, I think, at this moment in the development of the digital medium, I think we're far from understanding the genre and how far we, we really are from being able to say, you know, send me a treatment, <laughs> uh, whatever that might mean for the digital medium. In other words, the distance between our wish and our object is often so great because the forms and the practices, the procedures, in the creation of digital material remain profoundly unstable and speculative. I've often thought that McGann's premise can kind of be restated in this way. If you have produced, I don't know if he would agree with this, but, but I'm gonna put it out there. If you've produced what you thought you would, perhaps you've not created anything, really. If a digital project becomes what was specified it might not be a digital humanities work at all. 
So we've been asked to speak about challenges and opportunities today. And I'm going to suggest a, just a few examples that are in reference to uh, my humbling experiences in the railroad project for some years, um, and talk about the challenges and the opportunities as I see them. I think what we really are asking today is how does scholarly practice change with digital humanities? Or how do we do humanities in the digital age? This is all so very new. Everything is changing. There's no doubt about that. Our audiences are changing. Our procedures are changing. Our institutions are changing. So one question we face is this. Is an archive an argument? A related question is, where is our scholarship? Where is our scholarship? Now, most projects in digital humanities begin as a digital archive, creating a collection of documents that are digitized. I want to encourage this, of course. In the disciplines, we need more attention to this work as scholarship. But digital scholars also seek to both assemble and analyze, both examine and interpret. Five million books might be digitized, but the millions and millions of cubic feet of archival railroad records, well, that was something else. What do, what do we mean by a representative sample of railroad records? What do we do with this? How do we encode it? How do we make it relate to this or this? We're dealing with vastly different material objects in something like the railroad project. And this was a challenge for us because what we set out to create as an archive with an embedded argument in it, one of the first things we faced was the great diversity of materials we were trying to bring together. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about that in just a second. So we built a, a digital archive topically arranged for easy access and, and usability by the widest audiences possible. Railroad texts were structurally so dissimilar, however, like these, that we confronted major classification problems, ones that we couldn't really effectively address. The point is that the architecture and encoding of a digital archive, what Johanna Drucker calls, quote, creating the intellectual model, must be undertaken speculatively. It must be adjusted, changed, re-examined. Interpretive archives cannot be built to spec. At least in digital history, on one level, it is the diversity of document types that is yet to be fully confronted. We can build models from long runs of legal case files. We can build models from long runs of printed text that are all effectively the same runaway slave newspaper advertisements, for example. But when we turn to a domain like railroads, or slavery, or genocide, or the family, the intellectual model behind an archive becomes terribly important. And it also becomes quite a struggle to reconcile the specific classifications we need in order to make a digital object work in a digital environment. And the slipperiness and the, 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 the uh, expansive concepts that we're working with. So I think this challenges our opportunity to reconsider the digital archive as fully intentional, fully interpretive. And in our case, to offer in the Railroads Project a way to encounter the railroad. Rather than focus attention on the boardroom or the directors, reproducing annual reports, for example, we set out to open up a diverse array of railroad uh, users and interfaces. The argument would be to expose the way railroads were used and thought of. This would constitute a new history of the railroad, in effect, in America. But as we create interpretive archives, we need to be able to answer the question, and I don't have a precise answer. Uh, I think we're all struggling with this. This is where we are in the moment in digital humanities. 
where is our scholarship? Where do we locate our scholarship? Clearly, it's in the building of the embedded uh, material in an interpretive archive. This is where we need allies, too. Libraries, in particular, as partners in modeling, in preserving, in making available this form of scholarship. Second, second question we face in digital humanities right now is how do we work differently? And by this I mean in teams of scholars. Digital humanities projects are often routinely characterized as collaborative, and they are. In many respects, this is the most obvious change in scholarly practice. We work with librarians, we work with programmers, we work with colleagues in other disciplines, we work with our students. The opportunity here seems self-evident, but the model of historical and humanities scholarship has been sole author, sole researcher, for a long time. All of us who are in this field recognize this, and for most universities, the evaluation for hiring and promotion and tenure proceeds to assess candidates on this basis. Now, in the Railroads Project, I wanted a team of graduate students to have the opportunity to gain experience in digital work, to advance their own scholarship, and where possible, to participate in research publications. But I think the challenge for digital, digital humanities now is to make this work count where appropriate. We've begun keeping track of, uh, well, we have a whole collection of student projects, but we've also begun in the railroad project itself to intentionally focus on, sco on scholarly research production uh, pieces to come out of the project. And for as many people as possible on the team, to be involved in their authorship and publication. We'll be co-authoring new articles for the project with teams of researchers. Now, in the, I want to just make a distinction because in the early phase of digital humanities scholarship, we collaborated and there were teams that worked on projects and teams built projects, but now we're beginning to see teams contributing to publication streams. And I think that's a terribly important next step. The social structures for this and these contributions, they're not very well settled. We all feel it. We're in an, in an interesting place. At the beginning of this project in particular, I, I had only a vague idea how student colleagues would participate beyond building the digital project. But now we're beginning to see projects build in publication objectives and contributions at the start. We still, however, have work to do on how to, uh, how to promote uh, that team-based work in the humanities. So a third and uh, last question we face in digital humanities right now is, and I think in some ways this is the most important, what, scholarly art, what does scholarly argument look like in digital form? Some of our Nebraska Digital Workshop participants put this right in their abstracts. This is a critically important question. What do we mean by digital scholarship? What does it look like? Now, my colleagues at the Center for Digital Research and Humanities and my graduate students in the Department of History patiently bore with me on this one. <laughs> From the first, I had hoped to experiment with some new form of historical interpretive work. And this, this is what we began to call an assemblage, or a view. And some of them are listed here, views. The view is a framed set of materials on a given subject that integrates sets of evidence and data around a specific historiographical problem or question without directly narrating the subject. And we wanted these views to inspire investigation, to focus attention, to serve as interrelated starting points for people coming to the project. And we, we imagined having hundreds of views as part of this project. Now it turns out that the tools to assemble a view proved very challenging to create. We were all basically, after all, asking for an authoring tool in the digital medium for a new form. Of scholarship. The rise of the blog in the same period 
over the last five to seven years, in some ways kind of reduced the incentive for experimentation with scholarly argument and hypertext. And I think that's true across digital humanities, something I'm concerned about. Uh, how do we reach for new forms of scholarship that can be peer reviewed, that can be assembled, disseminated, and yet um, we, we've had a, a, a new technology develop the blog and a new genre, in effect, in blogging. But the changes in publication models should be an opportunity. I think we're on the cusp of a new genre of hybrid digital and print publishing. Books are and will be supported with digital sources, verifiable links to the elements that went into the study. Journals will move into this space, publishing born digital works also, integrating print and digital formats. So in the humanities, scholarly practice might shift. I'm not exactly sure how, and I think we're all struggling with what, what this shift in scholarly practice might mean. But I think it's headed towards something more fluid, more open exchange of ideas and arguments, characterized by a different sequence of activities. Imagine if it proceeded in this way, from openly available original research, from openly available original research, to preprint presentation, to peer review publication, to a period of open verification and testing, to a period of adjustment and re-examination. Now we know that uh, opportunities and challenges here remain. We're in the early stages of this medium. And we should look for ways, though, to enchant readers to hold attention, to create long-form arguments and short-form arguments in this medium. And here, in one way, we might be working against the medium, jumping through links and time on, on pages and so forth, but the iPad and tablets appear to be opening up new opportunities for scholarship in this way. So finally, we're in a transition phase. We call what we are doing Digital, digital humanities, or digital history. But really, we are doing humanities in the digital age, I think. We're doing history in the digital age. And this work is, I think, going to be characterized by three qualities. One, scale of research and data. It's large. Five million books, 100,000 newspaper articles, this is what projects are using now. In some ways, this is the least important characteristic, actually, because it's limited to scholars. But the, but the, the challenge will be not only to support this research with infrastructure, but to come up with intellectual models for such large-scale interpretation. Imagine how large-scale distant readings fit in the US history or literature survey. How do, how do we create intellectual models that can be pulled into these other places where they're needed? We've only just begun. The second quality is the globalization of discourse and materials. There are sources all over the world. They're waiting to be brought together. The challenge will be to create these linkages in the cultural record of the world, literally, from Cairo to Seville to London to Chicago. There are language differences, copyright differences, and sheer distance. But I think digital humanities will be, in the future, oriented toward this kind of, of, of uh, global discourse and connection. And third, Last, the decentralization of production. I've already spoken a little bit about this, but, but uh, we have students as colleagues. We have citizens as colleagues. The challenge here will be to validate, credit, integrate, and do so in a way that enables uh, further scholarship. I think we're doing nothing less than redefining our practices, and at the same time, our relationship, meaning the humanities relationship, to society. 
the past, our literature, history, culture, all, uh, all in front of society. Digital humanities is, is reconfiguring that uh, for, uh, for the public. Robert Darton has said that we're in the fourth grade information age. And uh, we're 15 years in to the fourth grade, the fourth grade information age in human history. It's not surprising we're learning. It's taken us some time to adjust. But, uh, but with, with adjustments and with uh, this, this energy that we all have, I think the future for digital humanities is bright. And the challenges and opportunities are great. Thank you. So I've been working in various ways on how to make computers better suited to scholarship since the mid-1990s, which makes me practically geriatric. Like, I guess I'm, <laughs> that's 15 years ago, right? Almost. So I, yeah, I was born with the information age um, as a scholar, I guess, and mostly in the area of producing research resources, born digital resources, as opposed to digitized um, resources. And I want to talk here briefly about um, challenges and opportunities in the digital humanities under four large headings. Scale, which we just heard about a little bit, um, the whole problem of information overload, silos, the barriers between research resources, semantics, which we can use to make the web more meaningful, and solitariness. We don't think that we're lonely online, but I think that as scholars we actually are. So first, I can advance. I'm not used to this flipping business. Uh, scale. The amount of information uh, that's digital is growing by leaps and bounds as we know. There's lots on the web, petabytes and petabytes. Petabytes are about a million gigabytes. And no one really knows how much there is. Um, zettabytes are a million petabytes. Uh, the World Wide Web Foundation has apparently got a million dollars from Google to try and figure out how big the web really is. So, you <laughs> so the problem of, of just trying to figure it out is obviously a big one in itself. Um, Plus there's lots more, lots and lots more data locked away in the deep web, in databases that aren't easily indexed by the search engines we normally use, or off the web entirely on hard drives in, in uh, enterprise systems that we don't access. The web contains a fraction of the amount of digital information in existence. And much of that information is in the form of text, which poses problems around findability and organization. And I'm not even going to images. <laughs> As you suggested, they have their you know images and videos and audios have uh, audio have uh, have um, serious problems too. But uh, in many ways, information processing was devised for numbers, and text is not that easy to handle. So the problem that we have right now, because there's so much, is not actually finding enough information, but finding too much information. Nobody goes through the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands hit, of hits that we uh, that we find in search engines like Google. Free text searching is pretty inadequate unless you have a really precise uh, search term. And Google works not because it understands the language that we're giving it, but on usage patterns that take you to sites that other people have clicked through to before. So it's hardly, you know, using a, a search engine like that means you're by definition not blazing a new information trail. It can't possibly be. So the information we want uh, is not very findable. The tools are not fine-grained enough. And then there's the problem of how to keep track of, of it all, how to organize it all, uh, once you've uh, got some sense of where you might be going, how to decide what to trust and what not to trust for research purposes. So um, this problem has become known uh, as a result of Greg Crane's influential article as the million books problem in digital humanities. So one of the problems, once we've got a million books, is that of processing. The person is gonna recognize this image. Um, as Crane pointed out in his article, we can't read a million books. We can't even read a small portion of a million books 
even if we read all the time and don't do anything else. Um, so Tanya Clement, John Unsworth, Sarah St Stager, 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 I'm not sure, Stager, um, from here at UNL, and uh, Kirsten Vizcalo proposed that we should not read a million books and how we should go about not reading a million books with the help of the Monk Project, which also involves Steve Ramsey and, and Brian Zellig from here. Um, so this is one of the opportunities, as uh, Will has already pointed out, that's presented by this challenge. We need new ways of finding out what we don't know, what we might want to read. We need new ways of making sense of what we don't and can't possibly read, but things that we nevertheless, nevertheless want to draw on to extend our knowledge and our understanding in ways that were impossible before computers came along. So there's lots of exploration going on now about the best ways of not reading, that is of processing large amounts of information. So we have um, maps nowhere near as, as pretty as uh, the ones in, uh, in Will's site. Um, we have graphs, graphs, sorry, um, and I think Colin Wilder's work in this area is really interesting, social network uh, graphing. Um, they can be used to represent and interrogate the relationships amongst people, places, organizations, or, or texts within sets of documents, or other kinds of visualizations um, that give us what Stan Rucker calls a sense of rich prospect when we're dealing with very large sets of materials. So we have a lot of work to do in figuring out which of these things work. We have quite impoverished vocabularies for visual knowledge, and uh, so a lot of work needs to go into trying to figure out what can effectively communicate uh, large collections of material and allow us to navigate through them in, in ways that are meaningful. Which brings me to the point about silos. Um, a silo, as, as I'm sure everybody who lives in Nebraska knows, um, originally refers to a building or container for storing materials in bulk, and these are good and useful things. They keep the contents of silos separate from the weather, safe from contamination by the environment or by other foods or, or products. However, in the context of digital research, the metaphor of the silo is a negative one, uh, connoting a lack of connectivity or interoperability amongst materials. It means that information is not talking well or, or uh, broadly to other information, that it's stored in a system that's not capable of interacting with other systems. And the web is a nice way of being able to link information uh, <coughs> to and, and from other information using the HTTP protocol, which is the whole thing that makes the web tick. Um, but a hyperlink has no knowledge of what's at the other end, or indeed if anything is there, as we all know from the uh, 404 message, um, other than that that is where the program, usually a browser, should try and find it, and what protocol to use for handling it if it does find it. So the protocol uh, specifies the rules, the format, and so on, but it doesn't actually, um, the link itself gives you no information about what's there. This was and, and remains in many ways the strength of the internet. It's decentralized, so a broken link doesn't break the page that contains it. Everything's not dependent upon everything else. It's loads better than having all of our stuff locked up in our separate computers, but it also has some disadvantages. I have to know that a link is there. I have to put it on my web page, and my system can't know anything intrinsically about what that link is about. It's just an address, a location. So we also need context for what we read, beyond just being able to link to things. For instance, we have a lot of literary texts online now, thanks to digitization projects, um, especially texts that are out of copyright. There are mass digitization projects like um, Project Gutenberg, um, the Google Books Project, the Internet Archive, but also very high quality ones like the Walt Whitman Archive. But how can we know about them? How do we know about their provenance, their trustworthiness, or just what they are in themselves? In a research sense, what they are in their context. How can we know anything about a book uh, without knowing what its context is, what, 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 it, um, what its relationships are, what it belongs to? We need to be able to put what we're researching in relation to other things. That's what distinguishes knowledge from information or data. In other words, that sense of context is crucial to um, knowledge work or research in, an in a rich information ecology. So the Orlando Project, which is the project that began in the earlier 90s, um, has created a really rich resource about women's writing in the British Isles. It's the equivalent of about 80 volumes of print of newly written digital text. 
every bit of information in there is cited to the source that it comes from, so it's a very useful tool in terms of being able to track back to um, where, the, where the information derives. There's lots of new and original findings. Sometimes it's the only place you can find something about a particular author or a text, and the text is structured so you can ask very specific questions like, how many governesses in the mid-19th century also wrote novels or religious texts, or, you know, or texts about governesses? for that matter, and there's a surprising number of governesses who wrote texts about governesses, actually. Um, so it's a great resource, but it's also a resource of limited utility for some kinds of research. Uh, one reason is because it's closed, it's behind the, the Cambridge subscription wall, um, but also because it's really siloed, and researchers who use it keep asking for links to primary texts, mostly. It's up to them to find the digital version of those texts. Why? Well, we thought long and hard about this when we were creating the resource, but those 404 messages that we all get tell us that you know, things move. Things were coming online so fast, we felt it would be a project in itself to try and keep on top of all the possible you know, digital versions of the text that we were talking about, because we talked about uh, tens of thousands of texts. And uh, so we you know, were quite selective in terms of actually putting in hard links to existing texts. And yet the digital versions of those texts are out there. And those primary texts need us right, for the context, and we need them so that people can test what we're saying against, the, against the, the sources. And there's in particular the Brown University Women Writers Project. Um, Orlando has a discussion of every single author and every single text in that collection. Right now it's up to you as a researcher to know that these two things are out there and to get them to talk to each other. But why can't these resources somehow know about each other? Surely that would be better. We need not just a one-to-one -one relationship today, the one between Brown and the Orlando project, but many-to-many -many relationships. Tim Berners-Lee, who's the man who, in so far as anybody did, invented the internet, not Al Gore, um, said that um, if you watch his TED talk on uh, what he calls the next web, what's often called the semantic web, he says data is relationship. And certainly research data, that is to say text, needs to be understood in relation to provenance, and other related materials. So we want the Orlando entry on the poet Pauline Johnson up here to be able to speak to early Canadiana online's versions of the primary text, to bibliographical resources like Tom Vincent's bibliophiles, to critical literature such as the Women of Canada, Their Life and Work, which came out from the National Council of Canadian Women in 1900, to periodical articles from scholarly journals and popular journals, and also to maps, to censuses, to probably railway timetables in the end. We want them all to be talking to each other which brings us to semantics, that word that has been identified by some at least with the next web. Semantics have to do with the study of meaning, with work under, with the work involved in understanding how meaning works and how to create meaning in the organization and management of digital resources. Semantics are a way of adding value to online objects so that what they are, what the object is, or what it contains uh, become more accessible. Semantic technologies and standards give us ways of exposing information about research resources that tell you something about them in ways that can be acted upon by computers. So XML, or Extensible Markup Language, is one technical means of enriching online materials with semantic content, and a great deal of very important work has been done in this area by digital humanists, uh, particularly by the textual editing community. And there's real potential for interoperability here of overcoming siloage. So for instance, the uh, Social Networks and Archival Context Project is taking XML information that's embedded in encoded archival context descriptions that are created by librarians for their own purposes and leveraging that to take, uh, to take that information about the letters and other documents stored in a bunch of different archives across the United States and bringing it together to provide a rich base of interrelated knowledge uh, about the people connected with that, those archives. And this is a project that's in its early stages, this is a prototype um, that you can see a couple of images from um, the pages of Ella Fitzgerald, which are being drawn from different sources. So this, the information, oops, there we go, yeah, so the information on that page um, doesn't live anywhere in a single place, it's all been harvested from these different archival locations, and um, so the timeline and the, and the relationships between the people um, are, are drawn from those sources. Translated into the technology that's most closely associated with the semantic web, RDF, or Resource Description Framework, 
Um, the same information can be transformed into a graph of the people related to Ella Fitzgerald, uh, even though no one archive set out to amass this information or to bring it into conversation with, uh, with each other. Interactive graphs such as the one in black here um, allow us to explore relationships dynamically, giving us a glimpse of what kinds of interfaces we will need in order to explore a web of semantically linked research resources. There are also interesting projects that are doing this with mapping, the Yuma project, looking at um, harvesting open linked data within a mapping environment that are experimenting with um, the potential in that area. I think Gentry is going to be talking tomorrow about his work with RDM, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, so there's this work that's drawing, uh, in the case of the SNAP project, on well-established authoritative lists of people and topics such as Library of Congress subject headings, Library of Cong Congress authority lists. But we also know from sites like Flickr about the, the power of folksonomy. So one of the things that I think is a challenge and also an opportunity for this community is to think about um, the fact that there's power in not over-determining what vocabulary people are using to describe resources. You can't, in fact, determine it all in advance. Um, it, it has to be, as, as Will was saying earlier, a speculative project. Any of our projects are always speculative. We're always trying to imagine what our, what our end users are going to want, and we never ever can, let alone know what we're going to want in a year. Um, so where's the sweet spot between um, trying to come up with standard and authoritative ways of describing information and actually letting folks on me um, muck around and, and, uh, and try to come up with solutions that we might have not anticipated that may actually turn out to be richer than the ones that the, um, the, author the authorities might, might devise because those authorities are based on what we already know in a certain sense rather than what we don't yet know. Um, so my final point has to do with solitariness. Many of us are very social on the web. We use Facebook, we use Twitter, we email if we're old fashioned or we message. Um, so we're connected. But I think that as researchers, we're actually still pretty lonely. We're not so far off with our tablets and styluses than this woman from Pompeii with her tablet and her stylus a long time ago. Collaboration, as, as Will said, and um, as this graph from the Digital Humanities conference this past June at Stanford indicates um, collaboration is growing in the digital humanities. This is the connections between the people at the conference simply based on the abstracts and the co-authorships and the relationships of those people from the same organization. So it would be a much richer and denser graph if it actually mapped all the relationships between them based on other kinds of associations. That's just the conference program visualized there. So yes, we are collaborating. We are not nearly as lonely perhaps as we as we once were, and certainly there are all those challenges to do with authorship and, and credit that Will was pointing to. So I'm not saying that we're not talking to each other, but I don't think we're doing so in the very fabric of our research lives. I don't think we're operating very differently than we would have operated 100 years ago. Email is faster, but I don't think that it's functionally very different from a note that could have gone by the penny post. And um, what I'm getting at here is that we're not tending to share in the processes of our work uh, itself. Um, to really meet the challenges of online research, I think we need to reimagine those processes. We will need collaborative systems that use semantics to facilitate the internal organization of large collections. And one of the big opportunities, I think, is for digital humanists to really start experimenting with semantic technologies, not just to describe our, our resources, um, but to really inter interlink them in the process of creating them in such a way that the interlinkages and the connections between them um, and between the resources of other scholars become part of the process of the research itself and become um, a shaping force in the research ourselves. So we don't want um, that. Uh, we don't want to, to perpetuate the, the hoarding process that has been sort of the scholarly instinct, I think, for a very long time. We still keep most of our work in progress on our hard drives until it's ready and polished and nice and neatly packaged to go out there into the world. This means that um, on a very basic level we're inefficient. I don't know how many people recreate the same bibliographical entries over the course of a year, um, but, but it would be a lot. Uh, and it means that we don't benefit from others' knowledge in the process. It means that we don't get as much feedback on our work as well. Now this is, I'm kind of oversimplifying things, of course. This is changing. I'm talking about what is a sea change that is in, in fact um, underway. 
Dan Cohen is just one of many people who are starting to model new ways of doing more open research uh, through media such as blogs, although I do, I do think you're exactly right that the blog is kind of, um, uh, compared to what some of us may imagine, a pretty impoverished form in which to be trying to do new long form scholarship. Um, and often it's sort of pre-print versions of things that are kind of being destined for print anyway, so that would be something really interesting to talk about. Um, but Cohen and the, and the Center for History and New Media at George Mason created the, the research tool Zotero that begins of, us to help see our way towards more collaborative scholarly environments. In Zotero you can not only collect and create bibliographic references and grab them from the web and um, link them to the materials that you're gathering, but you can also potentially, if you have enough online disk space, share widely, annotate um, collections of citations, and also use your collections with other tools for things like visualizations and timelines and so on. So there's, there's a really interesting project there of trying to take a very basic scholarly primitive and start to move it out into a more collaborative system. The Nines project, which is also represented up here, is also, I think, making huge strides in this direction, um, from starting from a different um, a different core activity, which is collecting all the resources related to a particular domain of study. So 19th century study, they have all the major journals. You can search them in full text, so you're no, no longer simply dependent upon the metadata in scholarly indexes and so on. And they're building it out from there into uh, systems for things like exhibiting collections or creating things like the, the sorts of views that, that Will was talking about earlier. Um, so these are, I think, really good starts. But we can and I think we should have more. Shouldn't we have environments that do for our research in progress what we want to do for all those literary texts out there like Pauline Johnson's? An environment that allows us to pull together all the resources that we want to refer to, helps us to relate them to each other, navigate through them, manage them, edit them, annotate them, visualize them, create new articulations of knowledge from our insight, share our results as we go with others who are interested in and experts on the same material or related material, whether those are classmates or peers or the or the general public and get feedback while the research is in progress. Creating such environments, starting to understand how they can help us as researchers to cope with the challenges posed by scale, by siloage, and by the solitary, I still think largely solitary, process of research. And indeed to harness the power of computers for research is one of the biggest challenges but also one of the greatest opportunities before us in the digital humanities. I'm along with others taking baby steps towards this um, in the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory. And while it's officially infrastructure, I do believe it has everything to do with the future of research. So I look forward to uh, more conversations, of course, in the afternoon and tomorrow. Thank you very much. No, I'm, I don't think I, I hope I wasn't talking about inventing a new no. inter-silo system. I mean, I think one of the strengths of the of, of linked data initiatives is precisely that they sort of allow you to keep your own vocabulary, but to interact with other vocabularies that nobody has to decide what the authoritative um, version is. Um, and I do think that, I do think we're very close insofar, I mean, I'm still learning a lot about how RDF works and so on, but I do think there's a lot of potential there for the kind of flexibility that a system would need to sort of move between the sort of 
a more specific or even possibly folksonomic world and you know, the, the world of these big, big things like um, the IAF or, or Library of Congress. Um, does that yeah. answer your question? I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understood the question in full, so if you want to elaborate further, feel free. I, I, you know, I guess I would just sort of, I guess I was curious to learn more if there would be room for them thinking about what the progress of that domain specifically looks like because you have a silo in the proper of the proper. I worry about as well, I just have a lot of history, so I'm curious what what the current progress on that project is. Yeah. I, that's a good question. I mean it seemed that ten years ago it, it felt like everybody would need to come up with a common authority list and point to it. And I, I think we've moved well beyond that now, which is what seems so hopeful to me because there was not much chance of that. small scale and large scale and digital projects. Um, but the emphasis of both talks was really on vast aggregations of, of content, large ambitious projects. And I'm, I'm thinking about people trying to get into digital advantage uh, at the beginning. They may not have collaborators, they may not have money to do a big project, they may not be in a place that's supporting it. Um, so I want to think a little bit more about the small scale projects and what potential there is. When I think about small scale, really successful digital projects, I start scratching my head and coming up mostly empty. So I'm curious if either of you can point to a few examples of really great small scale projects and, and then any other reflections you want to offer on this sort of problem for the beginning scholar who may not have the access to the possibility of entering into a vast project. Sure. Um, actually, I think that we're going to see a whole uh, wholesale development of smaller scale projects coming out of dissertation work. Uh, scholars who are who are doing smallish by the standards of say the Whitman project, um, they're doing a small project related to their to their dissertation, and uh, and I'm thinking of Andrew Torgut and the Texas Slavery Project, for example, where the digital project itself is is really a uh, database uh, and mapping project of, of, of reasonable scale, you know. It's got uh, um, several thousand entities in it, but it's not at the kind of 100 million um, words of scale or something. Um, but I also think that more and more data is available to be shared and extracted that's large in scale. So an individual can uh, has the opportunity now in a way that one didn't 10 years ago uh, when we were really looking at digitizing everything, you know, starting from the ground floor to digitize, uh, transcribe, make available, and then encode. That, 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 there's no wonder that people sort of, at least in history, you know, they kind of sat back and, and looked at the Valley of the Shadow, Shadow Project and said, okay, now that's, that's going to take, what, 15 years? Of, you know, <laughs> they were kind of, uh, it just, there was this huge problem, I think, 10 years ago with major projects that put the bar so far out there that it was hard for scholars, individual scholars, or scholars at less resource uh, endowed um, institutions to get into that. But I think the, the, that the field has changed substantially uh, now. Large scale data is available in a way that it wasn't. And I think we're seeing um, in graduate programs um, uh, humanity scholars uh, coming through those programs who recognize what's happening in the meeting. They can see where this is going, and so they want to be a part of it. And they, they fashion a, a, a strong a digital project that is taking form uh, on, a, on a scale that's not as large. And, is, and we're going to see more of it, I hope. I would very much agree with that. Um, I think that in addition to the fact that there's uh, data available, we also now have some tools available that make it easier to work with um, 
digital materials than previously. They're, they're a little bit, you don't necessarily have to be um, a really good programmer in order to be able to manipulate your stuff. I do think, though, that there's a need, um, to, and, and I agree that I, I see this more and more with PhD students, that they're already thinking about what they want to do down the line and what can they do that's manageable at the doctoral stage that will sort of seed the project and start getting them going. And I think, you know, come back tomorrow and hear what these new scholars are doing. Like, you, this is work that comes, I think, I'm, I'm not, well, all three of you, right? It all comes out of doctoral work um, and hasn't been heavily resourced or, or necessarily attached to other big projects, but is really significant and interesting and, and innovative. Um, but I do think that what's really needed to help these smaller projects, they're often not well known, precisely because they're siloed and often because people don't have the resources even to get them on a server that's really, um, you know, going to be findable over the long haul. So I do think that we need infrastructure that gives people um, the resources to give them somewhere to put their stuff that's, that's stable and, and um, also uh, give them easy ways, especially if they're just starting out in DH and as you say, not everybody's at an institution that can really give a lot of advice. Gives them a way of making their stuff, of, of exposing it and, and making it sort of as, as interoperable as possible given the resources that they have and, and, uh, and where their work is at. Great question. Um, I don't have a, a, a brilliant answer. I wish I did. Uh, I think film. I, I, I guess what I would point out is that um, often our our audience. I, I, well, I think we have to think about our audience. Is what I would say. Film developed over a period of time in a way that has met the audience's expectations for what uh, that form of expression of that genre. Uh, delivers, you know, and we we're uh, we're still at the the early stages of this, figuring out our audience and their expectations for history, say, uh, online. I mean, we 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 know much about our fellow scholars as an audience, where I think we're missing, and where film is, uh, of course, uh, far ahead uh, in its development, is what the what the audience of of readers, of general users, what they expect. And, and uh, the only thing I would say is that in the, in the Valley of the Shadow Project, we found again and again that they, they expected an immersive, I think I used that word, or I hope I did, in the, in the talk, um, an immersive experience. They, when, when we can deliver an immersive experience, um, we're, I, I believe we're on the right track toward uh, the kind of, um, connection with an audience that film is able to sustain. Some people compare it to gaming, but I think it's, it's a little different uh, in the humanities realm. They, they, they want to follow trails, as you said, through the past or through literature, and um, uh, part of it is game-like, but I think there's a quality of engagement there that if we can capture that and uh, bottle it up and <laughs> hold on to it, we, uh, we might be getting there. 